Welcome to lecture 13 of ECE 4305 Software Defined Radio Systems and Analysis. In this lecture, we will be looking at correlator receiver structures based on some of the discussions we have already looked at with respect to optimal detection schemes as well as Gram Schmidt orthogonalization processes for creating signal vectors. So, referring to a couple of lectures ago, when we talked about optimal detection, both maximum likelihood and maximum a posteriori detectors, um, we created a framework uh, using signal vector representations in order to come up with a decision rule that would yield the probability of correct uh, reception and, and attempting to maximize it. We're going to use that rule in the presence of an AWGN channel in order to come up with a closed form representation that can be implemented at the receiver for optimally detecting um, uh, intercepted transmissions uh, when influenced by an additive white Gaussian noise source. Okay. So when referring to lecture 11, um, and we saw the optimal detector, uh, which was in the case of um, uh, it, uh, maximum a posteriori uh, detection, when we uh, assume that the, the possible signal waveforms that can be transmitted uh, are not equally likely to occur, we get the following expression shown in equation one, which is uh, we're trying to maximize across all possible SI values. The PDF of rho given SI was transmitted uh, multiplied by the probability that SI was transmitted for I ranging from one through M. When we do have equally likely symbol transmissions, SI, uh, we get a maximum likelihood detector, in which case uh, equation two is almost the same like equation one with the exception that um, uh, a PSI is equal to one over M. And since that's a constant, that doesn't really influence the maximization process here. So we can safely discard it. So now uh, we go back to our received signal representation, which is shown in um, equation three, which is the received vector is equal to the transmitted vector plus the noise vector. Okay, so, so these vectors, um, uh, each one of their elements is influenced, uh, the transmitted signal uh, elements are influenced by noise vector elements in order to give us the receive vector. So let's, let's rearrange this vector representation such that we isolate for the noise vector. So what we get, okay, remember the discussion that we had with respect to the characterization of the statistical properties of the noise vector n and how it's Gaussian and its elements are Gaussian and it has zero mean if it's a zero mean uh, signal waveform for the noise, um, that it's gonna be a zero mean um, a noise vector and it will, have, it will be uncorrelated if it's AWGN. And we saw how that the joint probability density function of this noise vector, so across n dimensions, is equal to um, the PDF, one over two pi sigma squared to the power of n divided by two e to the minus magnitude squared of n. So that's the length of the noise vector from the origin in the vector space. So n square it divided by two sigma squared. So now it's kind of interesting. So we know that the noise vector is equal to the received signal minus the transmitted signal. So let's plug that in. And let's replace the receive signal with specifically the receive signal being equal to rho. And what we get is equation six. And it turns out that's a very interesting result because that's equivalent to rho, the, pro, uh, the PDF of rho, right? Which is the, is the transmitted signal plus the noise given that we transmitted a specific signal SI. So now we've got Hmm, this very interesting conditional PDF. And this is great because what happens is, look how SI, uh, we had like, we had N before, right? And N is zero mean. So if we had like a bell curve or a collection bell curves in N dimensional space that are all centered about the zero or, or, or origin, right? The, the, uh, like the zero on all the axes, that uh, what we have here is essentially rho, which is some distribution that may or may not be centered at uh, the origin, and we're subtracting off from it the deterministic bias SI. Makes total sense. This is great because now what we do 
is we take that guy. Now let's let's take each element of the noise vector, which is equal to each element of rho minus si, and that will be equal to a one-dimensional Gaussian probability density function, like we see in equation seven. And we know because they're independent and such that uh, the the joint PDF Gaussian PDF of the noise vector, which is equal to the joint PDF of rho minus si, which is equal to the joint uh, conditional PDF of rho given si, is equal to the product of all these one-dimensional Gaussian PDF shown in figure seven uh, in equation seven, which we have in equation eight. So hence we get this beautiful equation in equation nine that we can now start manipulating. So suppose we have a maximum likelihood detector, okay? So we take the expression for the ML detector, which we derived previously. And what we do is we're now trying to maximize SI for the PDF of rho given SI. And so we plug in that previous expression from the last slide into it. And so now what we want to do is we want to maximize that PDF, that conditional PDF, and it's it may look tricky, but we have a tr we have a tool up our sleeve. Did you notice that, like you know, when we try and maximize uh, that function, first of all, we have first of all we have a constant in front of that exponential. Does that conf uh, that does that constant influence the maximization process? Absolutely not. So we can throw that constant away. Next, um, what we can do. Um, is um, is essentially uh, take the exponent. And what happens is uh, with the exponent, if we try and maximize an exponential with, um, with all the arguments in the exponent, um, we can take the natural logarithm of that expression and, and, and transform that exponential representation into a linear representation, which is great. But basically, what I want to do is I want to get rid of the exponent and uh, uh, of the exponential, only keep the exponent. So I take the natural log of the max SI PDF of rho given SI. So, so what we're doing is we're just playing around because all in the end, at the end of the day, all we care about is finding the maximum. We don't care about the absolute value, rather just the relative maximum to everything else. So without changing the what the maximum is, we take the natural logarithm. And so now what we're left with is, sure, we have that uh, constant right in front of the, uh, ex uh, of the exponential. And uh, really, it's just, it, you know, we'll deal with that in a minute. Um, and we have that beautiful exponent by itself, the magnitude squared of rho minus si. Uh, and, and what that essentially is, that's a vector subtraction. So we have the vector rho, and we have the vector si, and we subtract it, and that displacement actually is our noise vector n. We find the magnitude squared, the length squared of that uh, vector subtraction, divided by 2 sigma squared. And we're now trying to find which si value maximizes that entire equation. And so what we do now is, as I mentioned before, does the, uh, that constant that was in front of the exponential influence the maximization process? Absolutely not. We throw it away. Now we have max SI minus um, the magnitude squared of rho minus SI squared divided by 2 sigma squared. We can now get rid of that denominator 2 sigma squared because again it does not influence the maximization process here. So now we're left with max SI minus uh, the magnitude squared of rho minus si squared. Uh, let's take this one step further. Do we need that minus? We can throw it away, but be careful because now, uh, what is if we have the maximum of a negative value, that's equal to the minimum of the positive version of that value. So hence, we go from a maximization procedure to a minimization procedure. So what we're trying to do, that and also getting rid of the square root because again, uh, that doesn't uh, influence our process whatsoever in terms of maximizing or minimizing. What we're ultimately trying to do, and this should make intuitive sense, folks, is that we're trying to minimize 
the the difference, the distance between the 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 head of the row vector to the head of the SI vector. So basically, the vector representation of the signal that we received and the vector representation of the signal that we transmit, we want to keep the vector difference between those two as small as possible. The 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 distance between the two as small as possible, and that is what we're trying to do. So the minimization of the distance between those two vector heads, uh, and we're trying to find which SI achieves that. That will be our decision rule. Uh, finding out what that distance is is not really super important. I'd rather find out which SI achieves that smallest possible distance between the two vector heads. That's why we use something called argmax, the argument uh, that gives us that maximum or minimum. So in this case, we have we want to find out the SK that gives the argmin of SI of the magnitude of the difference between rho and SI. Given uh, that, we hope to ultimately find that the reconstructed message is equal to the transmitted message. So as a result, uh, we, uh, since we can interpret this as a distance, our ML detector is equivalent to a minimum distance detector. And this is fantastic. So let's, let's take a look at an example. So suppose we have a QPSK transmission. All right. So we have a QPSK transmission and it has S1, S2, S3, S4. And what we want to do is we received a row. How would this all look like? So let's, let's, let's draw this and see how it looks. Okay. So let's draw the QPSK signal signal diagram and in the vector space. Okay. So we have our in phase and quadrature plane. And then suppose that we have S1 of T represented by the vector S1. That's the origin. Suppose we have S2 here. That's vector S2. Vector S3, that's the third signal constellation point. These, these vectors, essentially their heads lo are located at the signal constellation points. And last but not least, S4. So um, based on the decision rule, uh, we have some sort of nearest neighbor, um, uh, uh, nearest neighbor type of protocol being implemented. So what happens is uh, whoever, which, if we get, let's say some sort of, rec our receiver intercepts some vector that looks like this in the vector space, R, we then try and perform this nearest neighbor decision-making rule in order to figure out um, which which one of the four possible sig uh, you know, signal waveform op um, uh, options um, that R represents, because it's, of course, corrupted by noise. So what we do is we actually calculate um, the distance between each vector's head and the received vector. So we have, we compute the distance here, we compute the distance here, we compute the distance here, and we compute the distance here. And, and, and it's quite clear from this representation that R, my bet would be that R is S1, unless the noise is horrendous for some reason. And in general, what happens is, if you have a signal constellation diagram like you have over here, uh, what you can do is, um, if you're using some sort of um, you know nearest neighbor rule, you can create something called decision regions, where if if the head of a received vector occurs anywhere in that decision region, it's automatically mapped to that corresponding signal constellation point. So if R ever appeared in this quadrant of QPSK, I would instantly associate it with S1. Likewise. If R occurred anywhere here, I would associate it with S2. Over here, S3. And last but not least, S4 in that space over there. So we call these shaded regions decision regions. Okay. So it's all great that we have this new decision rule based on some minimum distance detector. How do we create a receiver that implements this realization? So let's take our decision rule. Let's expand it. So I put the square back in, okay? So we have min of minimum, minimum, uh, we're trying to find the minimum of the distance squared between row and 
SI, okay, the, the, the difference of the, the, that vector, across all SI. So let's expand out that um, uh, distance squared um, uh, uh, operation. So now we have a dot product that if we expand it out, we get this nice polynomial here of like row dot row minus two row dot SI plus SI dot SI. Now it's kind of interesting because uh, row dot row doesn't really change with any SI value. So we can discard it safely from our minimization operation that leaves the other two terms. So we rearrange it and we now get the maximum. We're trying to find now the maximum of uh, across all SI values that would yield uh, that maximum for two row dot SI minus SI dot SI. Okay, and uh, in order to find out row dot SI and SI dot SI, we, uh, from the waveform space, we have these two expressions down below. Great, because now with that, um, what we see essentially is that um, the, that minimum distance uh, detector implementation translates into essentially a correlation-based realization. What do I mean to say? So that, that integral of zero to t, rho t, si of t, dt, um, which is the dot product of rho with si, that is how much of the received signal correlates with si of t. And that other one, si dot si, that's the symbol energy of si. And it turns out that that symbol energy, because what we need to do is we need to subtract off from the correlation of rho with si, we need to subtract off the energy of si because that, because suppose each signal has a different energy amount. Uh, this could bias the correlation, so we need to normalize everything. So that's why we do that. And so this is a fantastic result. So let's, let's draw this uh, realization, okay? So let's, let's draw our correlator implementation, okay? So again, so we have our received signal, R of T, yay! And what we do now is we feed parallel realizations of it, this exact same waveform down se several branches. So let's say we have, um, in this case, four possible S's. Let's say R of T can be S1 of T, S2 of T, S3 of T, or S4 of T. It's one of the four. The first thing we do, multiply that waveform per period. So every T seconds, we multiply it with S1 of T, S2 of T, S3 of T, and S4 of T. And then we feed that product of the two waveforms over every T seconds into something called an integrator. So it basically sums up all the samples, the time domain samples. So we integrate over the period okay and then there's something called uh, we, we only take the, the the final outcome of the integrator so it's an accumulator essentially and then we sample at t equals kt same thing here same thing here same thing here now this is pretty cool because what happens is once we sample, we have to reset the integration process. So we then feed a signal, it's called dump, back to the integrator and it flushes the queue and starts from scratch. So we call this, this, this little system here, this integrator and the sampler and the dumping signal, integrate and dump, integrate and dump. Once we have that, remember that we have an issue with potentially each of these transmitted signals, these waveforms here, S1, S2, S3, S4, having different energy levels. So we have to subtract off from it the signal energies in order to prevent any sort of bias, right? So we uh, minus ES1 divided by two, ES2 divided by two, ES3 divided by two, ES, four divided by two. And last but not least, the receiver says, okay, who has the largest value? Choose max. 
and whoever, whichever one of the four branches during that symbol period has the largest value is our winner. And that's, that's, what the receiver, that's how the receiver decides on what has been intercepted. So now that we have a schematic of what the correlator implementation looks like, um, how, do we do, how do we interpret this? So we have a bank of all these correlators, each one targeting a specific waveform. One, like each, each basically finger or branch is looking at one of all the possible unique waveforms that can be uh, transmitted by the transmitter. And what we're trying to find is which one has the peak correlation. And what happens is when the, at, at the receiver, the choose max operation will say, aha, uh, this one has a maximum correlation for this time period. I'm going to go with that and, and make the decision that says that's, uh, that symbol was actually transmitted. And, and it turns out that this is optimal for an AWGN channel when all the uh, transmitted signals are all equally likely to occur. Okay? But it is vitally important, remember, that we need to subtract off the energy off of each branch of that signal waveform in order to make everything unbiased. Otherwise, you're going to have extremely skewed results.